Hello and welcome to the Hot Corner, a brand new all baseball themed show here on LTV. The way the show works is that there are three different time segments where our analysts will be discussing and debating different topics and questions. I'm joined here today by the great Harrison Durr and uh, my friend Brandon McGowan. Uh, but before we jump into the first segment, we will be discussing briefly Derek Jeter's retirement. Derek Jeter announced that he will be hanging up his spikes this year. Uh, so guys, um, do you think this is the best decision for him? Were you surprised by it? Harrison. Well, to start, I was just very surprised by it. You know, I, can, I honestly thought Jeter had at least two or three more seasons. Uh, you know, he's the childhood hero for every baseball fan. Even for me personally, being a Mets fan, I just, you have to look up to the guy. I have nothing but respect and, uh, you know, good things to say about him. Um, I don't know if it is the best decision for him because he's only 39. Yes, he had an injury plague season in 2013, but it was only his first ever injury plague season. So I think considering he had most of last year off, had this off season to get himself back into shape, I really think he could have at least a couple more seasons under his belt. Yeah, well, I I'm different. I, I was not surprised at all. I know, uh, you know, his manager came out and said he was surprised, and so did uh, Mark Teixeira. But, you know, really, it just it did not surprise me at all. He's going to be 40 come June. You know, he is coming off his worst season ever because, you know, he had the, the injury. Uh, and isn't his contract up after this year? And I don't, I don't think the Yankees want to give, you know, a, a really uh, another long contract. I want to be super long. But, you know, to a 40-year-old uh, guy, I think this is the best decision. You know, hopefully he has a, a decent year and just let him, you know, go out on top. But, um, you know, overall, I, I was not surprised by it. But, you know, I think following Mariano last year, I think this is just the right time for, you know, him to retire. But, um, you know what, maybe if he doesn't have a great season, maybe he'll try and come back for one more. But I, uh, I really don't see that happening. All right. Awesome. Well, guys, uh, that was great. And you're setting the tone for an awesome show. Uh, let's move on to our first segment. Uh, the way this segment works is that each analyst will have 90 seconds to discuss the question they are given, after which the floor will be open for three minutes for discussion and rebuttal. The first question is, who made out better in the Robinson Cano deal, the Mariners or the Yankees? Uh, Harrison Durr, I'm going to ask uh, you to start. All right, I believe the Yankees made out better in the Robinson Cano deal because they took the money <coughs> they didn't use on Cano and used it to fill more important voids, and most importantly, more than just one void. You know, they used it to get Jacoby Ellsbury in the outfield. They used it to get Carlos Beltran for DH or outfield. They used it to get one of the best young catchers in the game, hitting and defensively, and Brian McCann. And of course, most recently, they got to, to sign Tanaka, which they desperately needed help in the rotation. So I think overall, using that money to distribute it all around the baseball diamond, I think it's a much better decision for the Yankees. Uh, I, I actually think the Mariners uh, came out better on this one. And, you know, it's, uh, is it a real shocker that the, the team who signed uh, one of the best second basemen in the league came out on top? Uh, I don't think so. I, I know the contract seemed really long, you know, 10 years, especially at a guy who's, you know, 30 now. But uh, I, I see that he will have at least a minimum of five solid more years before we see any sort of decline. And, you know, I, I, I don't see him declining drastically once uh, he turns 35. But overall, I just think, you know, the, the best decision was for the Mariners to go and get a, a solid uh, key uh, guy, you know, to in their lineup. They already have, you know, one of the best pitchers in the league with uh, Felix Hernandez and uh, Iwakuma. But uh, I think they needed a, a big hitter and a big name uh, to add to the lineup. And I think it's going to attract more star players like it did with Fernando Rodney. I think bringing him out uh, you know, there, you know, he wants to win. He's used to winning out in Tampa, and I just think, you know, he's, he's, he's going to want to go to a team that can win, and hopefully Robinson Cano can turn that team around. So. See, unfortunately for the Mariners, I think by the time they'll be ready to win as an overall team, that's when Cano's decline is going to start. I don't think the Mariners will be a legitimate contender for at least two or three more years, and at that point, they're very well into the contract. And the Mariners understand this. You brought it up, the contract. They're paying really for five good years, and then they're just kind of dealing with the, the next five years. So I think by the time they're contenders, he's not going to be as good. He's not going to be a star player. Plus, we've seen before, Seiko Field, it ruins a lot of superstars. Adrian Belte, Beltre, when he was on the Dodgers, his last season hit 48 home runs, was second in the MVP voting, goes to Seattle, sends a huge contract, hits 10 home runs the next year. Yeah. So I think it's really drastically going to hurt his production. He really doesn't have any lineup protection. Yes, they signed Logan Morse and Corey Hart, but those are two guys that really haven't proven themselves that worthy in the major league. So I think Cano is definitely in for 
a steady decline? Uh, well, I mean, I, I do agree that it is a you know a, a huge ballpark compared to you know Yankee Stadium with that you know short red field porch where Cano is used to uh, you know hitting bombs too. But you know he's still a power hitter. He can you know use those gaps out in safe go to his advantage. You know get some doubles, maybe some triples, and just you know maybe his home run numbers will go down. But I, I think his RBI totals will stay up, um, and I. You know, I, I think you know his power numbers and average overall will, will stay the same. You know, if, if anything goes up, I think his walk total is going to go up because I don't know who's going to hit behind him. Maybe Logan Morrison, maybe Corey Hart, but like I said, there's just not protection there at all. True. Well, then, yeah, but then his you know on base percentage goes up, and you know yeah, he's he's a he's a decent base runner, so you know not maybe you they're know not base, for base percentage. I know they're not. They're paying for the power, but overall, I think I think the Mariners, uh, you know. They're, they're trying to get competitive again. They, you know, they, the city, they have great fans. They just they want winning baseball again. I think they, they had to go out and make a move. They, last year they tried, and they, I think they kind of gave up around the trade deadline you know, by trading Michael Morris. Um, you know, but n now they got an even bigger guy in, and I really think it's you know, the Mariners' time. And I think Robinson Cano is going to be that player to, to turn this franchise around. Do you think they're contenders this year? Uh, maybe not this year. Definitely not the, probably the first year in the contract. Hopefully he doesn't have, you know, um, you know, the contract, um, you know, uh, when Albert Pujols and Josh Hamilton and guys like that who get a you know, new team, new city, and they, they just, you know, flounder. I, I, I don't see that happening with Cano, but, and uh, hopefully it doesn't. But I, I see him um, really turning this team around this year and then maybe being competitive, like you said, in two to three years. So. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, yeah, we will. Well, it, uh, it certainly is uh, heating up in here. Let's uh, keep the train rolling, <laughs> shall we, gentlemen? Right. Uh, let's move on to the second question. Um, What's the best move for the Rays regarding David Price? Sign him, long term, or uh, trade him? Harrison, we started with you first, so we're going to move on to uh, the gentleman to your right. All right. Uh, I really think the Rays need to re-sign David Price. I know in the past they're not really a team who you know uh, signs guys long term. They usually you know they they have them, they bring them up on their farm system, which is a great farm system. They've done really well with that over the year. And then as soon as their contract's up, they you know they either they let them go or they uh, they trade them before they you know they're they're done to get prospects to you know start that cycle over again. Uh, but you know the Rays they need a, a solid staple in that rotation, and I think that's David Price. You know, they have, they uh, locked up Evan Longoria, you know, long term, who is, you know, great for them in that lineup. And now they have Will Myers under control for quite a few years, who's the AL Rookie of the Year. So they have, you know, some offense. They have a lot more, you know, I think uh, guys down the farm system is going to, you know, come up and, and produce well. But they need a solid rotation guy. And David Price, you know, the former uh, Cy Young winner, you know, he will provide that. And, you know, there's, you know, young guys, young pitchers coming in. He can provide that leadership for them. And, you know, I just, if you look, at, you know, they had Jeremy Hellickson, who was the, uh, you know, AL Rookie of the Year a few years ago, and now he is just declining, you know, drastically. So they, they can't depend on guys like that. They need David Price, who's proven himself year after year to be a solid contender. Harrison. Well, you mentioned Will Myers. The reason they got Will Myers is because they traded someone very similar to David Price in James Shields. Rays baseball is not to focus on fan favorites. Rays baseball is to use players when they have their highest trade value and use that to build all around the diamond, not just one position. And I think they should, tr they should trade D uh, David Price. They could get so much for him. They could focus on rebuilding the rotation with rather than just one ace with two or three solid guys, you know, maybe get an outfield spot or two, whatever else they need. But Rays baseball has worked in the last five or six years where they trade guys, high trade value, and they use it to their advantage. And that's the reason they've been to the playoffs uh, at least, what, three or four times since 2008. So I just, I think they should continue with their approach, and I think it'd be stupid for them to change that. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. They've had, you know, so much success over the years with, uh, with you know, bringing guys up from the farm system and, you know, becoming more than maybe they, they should have been. And that's, you know, proven to their success. But, you know, I just feel like, if okay, what about if, if they trade David Price? When would they trade him? Um, would they trade him before the All Star break? You know, I think before the trade deadline would be the, the best yeah. because, as we see, uh, when it comes to that, teams are really pressured to find what they need, and especially for a left-handed ace, that's about one of the most rare things yeah. I think you yeah, can really. get the trade deadline. So if he's available, and I think he will be, and you trade him uh, to some potential contender and get three or four top-notch prospects, then I think the Rays win that yeah. easily. Well, I mean, you just said, I mean, you know, uh, a, a lefty ace is, you know, somewhat of a rarity, you know, to come by. I mean, you have, you know, Kershaw out in uh, LA, LA yeah. and then you have, you know, Cliff Lee and Cole Hamels in Philly. Um, you know, and besides that, usually the, uh, you know, the dominant starters are right-handed. So I think, you know, you have uh, a gem like David Price, you know, a lefty who can, you know, strike out people and just, you know, a power arm. I, I really think you need to lock him up uh, long-term. 
But like Cano, though, what I said about the Yankees, you got to look at the bigger picture. Rather than just one star position, you have to look all around the diamond. And that's something the Rays have never had an issue yeah, with. And I, think I, I think if the Rays uh, sign him long term, I think they need to, you know, throw more money at him, and uh, you know, maybe not so many years. You know, maybe who knows what he's going to get? You know, what was the the longest contract was Kershaw? Was it seven years? He just got yeah, about seven years. So I, I think you know that's fine. Maybe uh, five or six, I think, would be uh, a decent uh, for David Price, but throw more money at him per year. For that, I think that would be a decent contract for the Rays. I don't know if he would take that discount, though, because as you said, they locked up Longoria, and yes, they locked up Myers, but Myers is still fairly young. So yeah. once that contract runs up, they're going to have a serious dilemma, and I just don't think they can afford all three of them yeah. and prices the admin out in my Very true. I mean, they, they don't have the, one of the highest uh, payrolls no. like the other teams in the league with the Red Sox uh, or the Yankees. But I think the catwalks in their ballpark uh, says that pretty clearly. Yeah, that's very true. But. Well, uh, gentlemen, I'm loving how heated your debating is getting. It's, uh, oh, it's overwhelming, actually. Uh, so let's move on to our last question, uh, which is um, we're going to go back to Harrison. Harrison, who made, uh, who made out better in the Fielder-Kinsler deal? Uh, is it the Rangers or the Tigers? I think it's the Tigers. We're sticking to my theme here that I've been doing in the last two questions. It's about the overall bigger picture. Trading Prince Fielder enables the Tigers to sign Max Scherzer to a long-term contract and enables them to sign Miguel Cabrera to a long-term contract. Obviously, those two are more important than Prince Fielder in my mind because, one, Prince Fielder signed a nine-year contract. As we know, ten, nine, eight-year contracts, they never work. Fielder's already two years into that contract, and already that decline is shown in the postseason. His last 60 postseason at-bats, he doesn't have one RBI. And you're hitting uh, behind one of the best, actually the best hitter, in the game of baseball, Miguel Cabrera. Plus, you had solid guys surrounding you with uh, Victor Martinez and Johnny Peralta. So there was really no excuse for Prince Fielder. Uh, and then, honestly, Ian Kinsler, very underrated second baseman, in my opinion. Last year was a bit of an off year, but he's one of the guys, I think, is a classic case of needs a change of scenery. You know, he gets in that Tigers lineup, he hits towards the top. I think he might have himself an all-star season. And once the Tigers lock up Scherzer and uh, uh, Cabrera, if they do, then I really think... Uh, they're going to be pretty happy with the results. Brandon, I'd love to hear your retort. <laughs> uh, well, again, I uh, disagree with Harrison. I, I, think, oh, okay. <laughs> I, think the, um, I think the Rangers really made out on this deal. Um, obviously, money <laughs> right now is uh, of no issue for them. They, gave, you know, they, bought, they got the whole huge contract for uh, Prince Fielder, and then they went out and uh, signed uh, Sinsu Chu um, for about you know, $130 million or you know, so uh, around there for seven years. And you know, they just they don't have, uh, they're not financially strapped right now, and so they're going out and they're getting the big guys. And Prince Fielder has proved himself year uh, after year of just being such a, a quality and consistent guy. But he's so durable too. He, he barely misses any time. He has multiple seasons where he just doesn't, doesn't miss any games at all. Uh, I think they need that, you know, and going to a warmer, uh, warmer city. I think that'll just help him stay on the field longer. But you know, they they need that power. Um, you know, now, you know they have Sin Su Chu. You know, he's going to be a leadoff guy. Great on base percentage. He's going to get on. Uh, base and then I think you know Fielder who probably hit th uh, third or fourth is going to just you know knock him in and so his RBI totals are going to either stay the same or, or go up in my opinion. Uh, you know also with um, with their solid uh, pitching rotation you know with uh, at least with you Darvish who was amazing last year led the league in strikeouts you know they they are rounding them uh, themselves off really well right now with the uh, the offense and their uh, their pitching and I really think that. Um, that fielder going there is, is only going to make his numbers uh, go up. You know, they have that jet stream uh, out there where that ball just carries. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it just be a, a great fit for him. See, the way I look at it, yes, he has the jet stream, but everything else is almost identical. Texas has a solid rotation led by Ace and U Darvish, probably an even worse rotation than Detroit because Detroit I still think has the best rotation in the game. But they're right there with U Darvish and uh, Derek Holland and Alexi Ogando and all those guys. You have a very solid lineup. You mentioned Sinshu Chu, Adrian Beltre, um, Jerks and Profar, you know, if he does pretty well. They have a lot of solid guys to surround him. But Texas will regret that contract when they play their first October <laughs> baseball game with Prince Fielder. I'm telling you, he just, he's a completely different player in the postseason. He's honestly the A-Rod of this generation <laughs> in the postseason. It's, it's not good. Being, a, you know, Kind of a Tigers fan for my dad. I've seen every game with him in the postseason, and he just looks comfortable, uncomfortable, awkward, and I'm I'm really not watching the same guy here. So, 
I think once we get out, get to October, it's going to be uh, very interesting for Texas fans. Well, well, maybe that's what he needs. He just needs a change of scene, uh, change of scenery. And when he gets in the postseason with Texas, you know, maybe he'll you know thrive. And uh, maybe Detroit will start uh, regretting uh, trading him. But you also brought up the point of uh, Jarkson Profar. I think that was also another thing that needed to be done for Texas. You know, they had this guy, you know, top prospect down in the minors, but they they have no uh, place for him with Ian Kinsler, you know, taking second base. And so now that they traded uh, Kinsler away, it opens up the door for Profar to just you know go into spring training this year and and. Uh, you know, get that job at second base. I, I honestly think it's his job to lose. You know, and so right now he just needs to prove himself, which I think he will. So far, his uh, short time in the majors has been, uh, you know, pretty successful. So I, I think uh, he will be the um, the franchise's long-term second baseman for the future. And now is his time to shine, and it just, you know, gives him that opportunity that he's no longer uh, in the shadow of Ian Kinsler. Uh, and that just adds another piece uh, to that uh, offensive lineup with uh, Profar, uh, you know, and Fielder, and you know, Chu. I just think. Uh, all the pieces are coming together for Texas. They were very disappointed, obviously, with the two World Series losses, you know, back to back, um, and then you know, falling uh, year after year in the past two years of the division to the Athletics. I think this is what they're doing. They're going out and saying, "We're not done yet. Our time and our window is not closed. We need another big guy and big pieces to uh, to you know make our team uh, successful again." Well, I will agree with you that Fielder is a better player than Kinsler. Yes, they're hard to compare, but Fielder is a better overall hitter. But I'm bringing it back to the long picture. Yeah. I think, yeah, you mentioned Profar. That's what the Rangers are looking at. But the way I look at it is keeping Cabrera and Scherzer is a lot more important than the development of Jerks and Profar. Uh, Scherzer and Cabrera, in my opinion, are two much, much more, more valuable players than Prince Fielder. Um, they need to keep them if they want to keep that core. And, you know, every time they've had that core now, they're a World Series contender. And Prince Fielder hasn't been considered a part of that core. And anything I think they get from Ian Kinsler is honestly just the cherry on top. Yeah, but uh, what do you think? Now that they, you, know, you said they freed up all that money for the contracts of uh, Prince Fielder, but now you know they they have to go and sign long-term contracts for you know Cabrera and uh, Scherzer. I think they're going to regret those. So I think you know two long-term contracts is way worse than one. Ooh, at the buzzer, gentlemen, we are Very having close. a good time right now. You having a good time? Yeah, you having a good time, a Harrison. Fun. I'm just so glad. All right, well, uh, that wraps up the first segment. After the break, we'll dive into our rapid-fire segment. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Hot Corner. Let's dive right back into it, shall we? It's time for our rapid-fire segment. I will ask each analyst a different question, and they will have 30 seconds to discuss it. Our first question is for you, Brandon. Will the Phillies be fighting for a playoff spot come September 1st? Uh, as a Phillies fan, I sure hope so. <laughs> uh, you know, there's not too many high expectations going into this season, at least for the fans. And, you know, the players every year think they're, you know, going to be able to compete. And I, I hope they do. But I think the key will be health. If uh, the core of the guys, especially the infield, who are, you know, extremely old right now, um, can stay healthy, uh, Rollins, Utley, and especially Howard, and if they produce uh, even just, you know, somewhat of their, uh, their old selves, I think they come September 1st, they will be fighting uh, for a uh, playoff spot. Not going to be division. You know, it'll be a wild card spot, and you know, I'm not saying that they're gonna win the wild card spot, Ooh. but I think they'll be in it. Very good, Harrison. Uh, next question: Who will be the surprise team of 2014? Uh, I think the Arizona Diamondbacks. They added Mark Trumbo, a very solid uh, addition to their lineup. He'll hit right either before or after Paul Goldschmidt, so that could be a really dynamic one-two punch. You got a proven closer in Addison Reed. You know, he pitched in the AL, AL Central, so he dealt with Miguel Cabrera a lot. You know, AL East still had to play them, so all those tough ballparks and hitters. And they added Bronson Arroyo to stabilize the rotation. Very durable guy. I think he's pitched at least 30 games since like 2007 or 2008. So I think those three additions will give Arizona a very good chance to compete. Very good. Brandon, we're going back to you. Uh, who will have a better bounce back season and start living up to their contract? B.J. Upton or Josh Hamilton? Oh, both dismal seasons last year. Yeah. Uh, but I really think Josh Hamilton. He's a competitor. You know, he's proven himself year after year, especially in Texas, you know, that he is a competitor and he puts up great numbers. Uh, he's already got one year now under his belt out in Anaheim. And I really think uh, between, you know, healthy Albert Pujols and, you know, Mike Trout, who is going to be Mike Trout, I really think it'll, it'll finally click for him. Uh, and you know he'll he'll be able to get out there and just put up those big numbers uh, again. And I think this is the Angels' year, and I think it's going to be because of uh, you know uh, Josh Hamilton getting in. All right, uh, Harrison, your second question is similar to your first. Uh, who will be the disappointment of the 2014 uh, season and not lived up to their high expectations? Unfortunately, I think it might be the Detroit Tigers. You know Ooh. they're playing small ball this year, something they haven't done in years. They have a new manager trying to find his identity, who's only four years removed from the game, I believe. So how is he going to relate to the players? Uh, Max Scherzer, you know, I love to see him do well, but I don't think he's going to have the year he had in 2013. You know, as we saw with R.A. Dickey, you know, 
clearly he struggled after his you know dynamic season. I think he's still going to have a great year, but it's not going to be a Cy Young season. So if the Tigers can find their identity, they'll be okay. But if they can, it's going to be tough for them. Awesome. Well, Brandon, uh, your last question is, uh, will Marlon Bird have another career year or uh, at least one close to last year, being that he's with a new team? Oof. Well, again, as a Phillies fan, I sure hope so, because <laughs> it seems like he's going to be taking away uh, some of bats from Darren Ruff, the, uh, the young outfielder. Uh, slash first baseman, and that's a little disappointing. But I think in a new ballpark, a smaller bar, uh, ballpark, you know, uh, you know, have that um, the nice change, uh, and it'll add to his power more. It might not be another career year, but I think it would definitely be close to it. You know, he was hitting in you know huge city field last year and put up great numbers, obviously career numbers. Uh, but you know, now he's in a smaller ballpark, uh, hitter friendly, and I really think that uh, his numbers will be similar to last year. Awesome, uh, Harrison. Your final question is: Will the Phenom <laughs> Will the phenom known as Yasiel Puig be as explosive a player as he was last year, or uh, does he have a full year ahead of him? I think the sophomore slump, unfortunately, for Yasiel Puig will find him. You know, he hit about like 500 the first two or three weeks of the season, but then he cooled down. You didn't really hear his name much come September and October, especially in the playoffs. So I think, like most really solid rookies, you know, he's going to struggle to try and get in uh, 150, 160 games. Uh, Health-wise and then production-wise, I just think you know it's not going to be easy for him. But come his third year, I think you know he'll be right back to Yasiel Puig. Awesome, good job, gentlemen. Uh, well, that's the end of our rapid-fire segment. We'll be right back after this quick break. Welcome back. It's time for our last segment. Uh, now or never. Never. Both of our analysts will have uh, about a minute to discuss something from earlier in the show or bring up a topic uh, to discuss quickly. Uh, Harrison, you're going to go first. All right, I feel like I have to address it since I haven't addressed it at all uh, the show yet. Uh, the New York Mets, Oof. my team. Um, I'm sorry. I, thank you. Um, I actually think that they will be able to get out of 70 win purgatory, finally. <laughs> you know, ever since City Field opened, we've had 70 wins every single season. But even though Matt Harvey's hurt, I believe the development of Zach Wheeler, Travis Darno, and Noah, and Noah Syngard will really allow the team to, to get to 80 wins. Even if that's below 500, I'll take 80 wins. You know, the development's there. Got Granderson in the lineup, Chris Young, potentially Steven Drew. I think he'll, he'll end up in the Mets in the next coming weeks. I just don't see a, uh, any other fit for him. So I think those additions and the development of the younger pitchers and catcher and Darno will be enough to get us out of purgatory. Awesome. Uh, good luck being a Mets fan. Brandon, <laughs> you're up. Uh, well, then I'll go off of that, and I'll, um, I'll talk about my Phillies, uh, like I said earlier in the show. Uh, I just want to clarify real quick, like I said uh, earlier, I do uh, feel like the Phillies will be in it. it, it it's going to be a long season. Uh, there's no <laughs> doubt there. Uh, but I Both think come uh, September, uh, you know, they're still be in the hunt. You know, whether they're, uh, you know, I don't think they have control of the wild card, but I think they'll still be, you know, in the, the fight for it. Hopefully up until the last week, make it interesting, you know, make those uh, games in September uh, meaningful again. But like I said, it's going to come down to uh, the, the, the core uh, players, uh, Howard, Utley, Rollins, and, uh, you know, now even uh, Brown to put up numbers uh, like they're capable of. Uh, especially Dominic Brown. You know, he had a great year last year. Uh, well, great May, uh, month of May uh, and the first week of June. He needs to uh, keep those numbers consistent. You know, he doesn't have to, uh, you know, hit like, you know, 20 home runs uh, a month again. But, you know, he all he has to do is, you know, stay consistent and, uh, you know, s uh, spread that power out throughout the entire year. And I think, uh, you know, the Phillies will, will be somewhat of a, of a contender next year. Fantastic. All right. Well, uh, that does it for our first show of Hot Corner. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, if you're interested in joining LTV, like us on Facebook or email us at ltv at tcnj.edu. Have a good one.